we are presenting our experience on ostrigonum excision in dancers via an open posteromedial approach. The following video is based primarily on our paper published in 2017. Hello, I'm Dr. Donald Rose. An ostrigonum is a potential source of posterior ankle pain in dancers, often associated with flexor hallucis longus or FHL pathology. There are several options for a surgical excision of asymptomatic ostrigonum, refractory to conservative management. These include open excision via posterolateral or posteromedial approach, subtalar arthroscopy, and posterior endoscopy. In dancers, FHL pathology is frequently concomitant with a painful ostrigonum. The open posteromedial approach is a safe and effective method for operative management of the symptomatic ostrigonum while allowing for a complete identification and treatment of associated FHL pathology. The purpose of this video is to discuss the diagnosis of asymptomatic ostrigonum and to demonstrate the technique of ostrigonum excision with concomitant FHL tenolysis and tenosynovectomy via an open posteromedial approach. The ostrigonum is the second most common accessory bone in the foot. It is the result of a secondary ossification center that mineralizes between the age of 8 to 13 and then fails to fuse to the lateral tubercle of the posterior process of the talus. The ostrigonum is not a loose body, but an intraarticular os that is typically secured to the lateral tubercle of the talus by a fibrocartilaginous synchondrosis. It was first described in 1804 by Rosenmuller. Its approximate incidence is between 7 and 14 percent and is bilateral in 50 percent. Ostrigonum syndrome is a variant of posterior ankle impingement syndrome. The impingement occurs when the ankle is in plantar flexion and the ostrigonum is compressed between the posterior tibia and the calcaneus. Ostrigonum syndrome is primarily caused by overuse injury. This is microtrauma or stress to the ostrigonum and posterior ankle capsule due to repetitive plantar flexion. It can also be caused by acute trauma, which can cause slight movement of the ostrigonum, leading to symptoms of impingement. Ostrigonum syndrome is often seen in classical ballet dancers due to their demands of repetitive forced plantar flexion in tone due position, as well as their need to be fully weight bearing in hyperplantar flexion while on point. It is also seen in soccer players and football kickers due to repetitive forced plantar flexion. Of note, not all people with an ostrigonum have symptoms of impingement, and the amount of pain does not directly correlate with the size of the os. Even if dancers with ostrigonum do not have pain, they may have a bony endpoint preventing them from achieving full point. A patient with ostrigonum syndrome will typically note pain in the posterior aspect of their ankle with tendu, releve, and point. They may note decreased range of motion in their ankle compared to the contralateral side, unless the os is bilateral. They may also report clicking in the back of their ankle. On physical exam, the hyperplantar flexion test passively plantar flexes the ankle and results in pain. The pain is relieved when the ankle is returned to neutral position. A positive hyperplantar flexion test is indicative of posterior ankle impingement. This differentiates posterior impingement from Achilles tendonitis, which would have a negative hyperplantar flexion test. Patients may also have decreased passive plantar flexion range of motion and typically have tenderness over the lateral or medial aspect of the posterior ankle over the ostrigonum. Both x-rays and MRI are useful in the diagnosis and treatment of ostrigonum syndrome. X-rays will usually show us the presence of an ostrigonum. These are best demonstrated on lateral radiographs 
with the foot in neutral or plantar flexion with 20 to 25 degrees of external rotation. The top left radiograph is a lateral of the ankle with no ostrigonum. The bottom left radiograph is a lateral of the ankle with an ostrigonum. The right sided radiograph is of a plantar flexed ankle with the ostrigonum. X rays, however, do not show us the full extent of posterior impingement due to soft tissue and cartilaginous structures that may be involved. Also, due to bony overlap, a small ostrigonum may be missed on routine x-rays. An MRI is more sensitive than x-rays in fully evaluating the source of posterior ankle impingement. MRIs more fully show the extent and structure of the os, which is useful for surgical planning, as well as revealing associated FHL pathology or presence of ganglion cysts. Normal variants such as an accessory soleus or an accessory FHL may also be identified. The upper image shows an os with bone edema, and the lower image is an example of FHL tenosynovitis clearly seen on the MRI. An ultrasound may also be used to assess an ostrigonum, but since an MRI is almost always obtained, it renders the ultrasound study superfluous. This MRI image demonstrates the proximity of the FHL to the neurovascular bundle. It also demonstrates that the os is often a relatively medial structure. Flexor hallucis longus tendonitis, also known as dancer's tendonitis, occurs in an estimated 63 to 85% of patients with ostrigonum syndrome. The FHL tendon runs in a fibroosseous tunnel or tendon sheath between the medial and lateral tubercles of the posterior talus. With repetitive hyperdorsiflexion of the first MTP joint and plantar flexion of the ankle, the tendon is maximally pulled into the tunnel, which can result in tendonitis and tenosynovitis. This may be exacerbated by a relatively low FHL musculotendinous junction, which may impinge on the entrance of the tendon sheath. The FHL tendon can be caught in vicious cycle of inflammation and irritation, causing posteromedial pain and crepitus felt along the tendon during hallux motion. The dancer may experience trigger toe when the FHL tenosynovitis or partial tear catches while trying to glide through the tunnel. Testing for FHL tightness is seen in the images. One would see decreased passive extension of the hallux in neutral ankle dorsiflexion compared to when the ankle is in plantar flexion. Conservative treatment options for ostrigonum syndrome include physical therapy, restrictive figure of eight taping, NSAIDs, activity modification, and rest. The goal is to decrease inflammation and therefore symptoms. A cortisone injection into the area of the ostrigonum may occasionally be useful to help decrease symptoms on a short-term basis to get a dancer through a short period at the end of a season, but long-term have not been found to be successful. While injections are infrequently used, if necessary, they are performed under ultrasound guidance. Surgical treatment is considered after conservative management has failed for symptomatic ostrigonum. Several surgical options exist, including posterior endoscopy, subtalar arthroscopy, and open posterior medial or posterior lateral approaches for excision. There is not yet a standardized treatment option. Posterior ankle endoscopy is a minimally invasive technique. However, the portals places the sural nerve at risk. Additionally, the FHL sheath is not as easily visualized and more difficult to release with this approach unless the surgeon is very proficient in posterior endoscopy. In the dancer population, an ability to fully evaluate the FHL tendon after release of approximately 2 to 3 centimeters of the fibroosseous sheath as well as being able to debride 
and repair any tendon tears is important. A partial posterior capsulectomy is also performed with the endoscopic approach, although the importance of preservation of posterior capsular integrity in the dance population has not been determined. Subtalar arthroscopy is also a minimally invasive technique but is technically challenging due to the small subtalar joint space. Studies have shown that sural nerve palsy is a possible complication, although the rate of nerve injury is low. The ability to assess and treat the FHL is limited, but does improve with increased arthroscopic proficiency. The posterior lateral open approach is preferred by many surgeons because they assume it is safer and easier. However, there are no recent studies to support this claim. With this approach, the sural nerve and small saphenous vein must be protected, and one study of 41 patients had 10% with transient sural nerve injuries and 10% with permanent injuries to the nerve. A more recent study of 20 patients had 5% with sural nerve injury and 10% with sural neuropraxia. Surgeons must be aware that the ostragonum may be relatively medially located and therefore must also protect the FHL and the medial neurovascular bundle while trying to extricate the ostragonum. The FHL is unable to be as easily or completely assessed since it is a medial structure. One study on the posterior lateral approach found that two thirds of their dancers had occasional pain in the posterior ankle postoperatively, which may be due to unaddressed FHL tendon pathology. Again, the neurovascular bundle directly medial to the FHL tendon sheath is relatively difficult to protect when identifying and addressing any FHL pathology within the fibroosseous sheath.